Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. More on them in a bit. A white elephant refers to an extravagant, impractical gift that cannot simply be disposed of. The phrase is said to have originated from a practice by the King of Siam. He would give away rare albino elephants to courtiers who annoyed him. Hopefully, they would be ruined by the animal's upkeep costs. It appears that the people behind today's project took direct inspiration from this historical tale. Uh, they even made it white. This building was constructed to celebrate the beginning of a new era and bring a new landmark to London. Impressive as it might be, questions were asked about its purpose or what was inside it, and most importantly, who is going to pay for it? Today on Mega Projects, we're looking at what happens when a new government, which is determined to prove itself by staging a huge celebration and big engineering project, doesn't go to plan. With funding problems, no creative direction, political infighting, and an angry public to contend with, it's not a surprise that the Millennium Dome was considered a failure. But was it? The story of the Dome is a politically driven one, beginning in 1994 when Prime Minister John Major's Conservative government turned its attention to celebrating the upcoming millennium in six years' time. The idea being that an event of some kind could be had to celebrate the dawning of a new era. One idea put forward was a Festival of Britain to showcase everything the country had to offer in terms of culture and creativity. This great idea was a recycled one from the 1951 Festival of Britain, which had as the main attraction a Dome of Discovery. And, well, it worked once, so why not try it again? The PM formed the Millennium Commission in 1995, headed by Chief Executive Jenny Page, to run the project. Things were starting well. It would be a tight deadline to meet, but it was still achievable, so long as a creative director for the project was chosen, and if nothing politically major happened in between. Well, in 1997, the government lost power to new Labour, so, well, that was a bit of a hiccup. With the new government in place, they inherited and greatly expanded the project. New Prime Minister Tony Blair wanted it to be a giant festival that would run for a whole year. It would be a showcase of what the tabloids had coined Cool Britannia, presenting a vision of Britain as a creative and vibrant country with a dynamic new government. A lot was riding on this project, for it would be an expression of how this new government worked to pull off such an event. The PM wanted to show how they could work with major corporations to sponsor different elements of the festival into something working and profitable. This wasn't just a New Year's celebration. It was a statement. Finding a suitable location in Britain for such an event was imperative. Not just a suitable site was needed, but one that was in a terrible state of disrepair. If the government could change the fortunes of the site, then it would be a huge win, not just for the area, but also for new labour. There were many to choose from, with the short list of locations consisting of Birmingham, Derby, Stratford, and the Greenwich Peninsula. Ultimately, Greenwich was chosen, the site of a former gas works, with its soil laden with arsenic and mercury, and a few unexploded bombs thrown in for good measure. Exactly the kind of area that needed regenerating. Another reason for choosing Greenwich was a logical one. Close to the Greenwich Peninsula is the home of the Meridian Line, the point of zero degrees longitude from where the new millennium would begin. But that's not strictly true. A new year starts on Caroline Islands, which is situated just east of the international dateline. Piddling detail, but well, it's all in the past now. Now that the project had a location, what was going to go there? Inspiration was again taken from the 1951 festival and its dome. What the architects had planned was not, strictly speaking, a dome, but rather a tent. Mike Davies, along with his team at the Richard Rogers Partnership and engineers Burrow Hapold's plan, was a giant oversailing roof within which individual displays could be constructed. This would keep visitors and exhibitors protected from the weather, and most importantly, this structure could be simple and quick to erect. The huge structure would offer 100,000 square meters, or a million square feet, of exhibition space. Measuring 365 meters in diameter with a circumference of 1 kilometer and a height of 50 meters. The dome would be suspended from a series of 12 100 meter or 330 feet tall steel masts held in place by more than 43 miles or 70 kilometers of high strength steel cable that supported a Teflon coated glass fiber roof. This design was to emulate a clock face or calendar with each of the masts representing the months of the year. The budget for the dome was stated to be 750 million pounds or 976 million dollars with the building itself being remarkably inexpensive budgeted at 43 million pounds or 46 million dollars. 
This included groundworks, perimeter walls, masts, the cable net structure, and the roof fabric. This simple construction meant that the design teams had more time to figure out what was going to go inside. Publicly, the dome project was progressing nicely. With the concept designs and ideas being revealed, it appeared to be an efficiently run project. Things weren't quite so simple, though. There was enough political infighting and resignations to fill a video all by itself. Put simply, there was no creative director for the Dome project. This left an inexperienced middle management team to supervise the designers. To solve the problem, Jenny Page formed the Litmus Group. Made up of museum directors and television bosses, it was their job to handle the designers' ideas for the Dome and pick the best and most viable for the project. But having a group of people taking on the role of a single person caused another problem. How could a group of people have one vision. One of the designers described the Litmus Group as made of people who couldn't make decisions. There was no clear idea of what the whole thing was meant to be about. Other than celebrating the third millennium, nothing could be agreed upon. All right, we're going to get back to today's video in just a minute, but first, here's a quick word from today's brilliant sponsor, Squarespace. Look, if you want to make a website, there is no one else you should be thinking about in 2022 other than Squarespace because they are the easiest and best place to make a website. If you've got an idea in your head and you're like, I want to make a website of that, but you don't know anything about HTML or coding or even how computers work, well, don't worry. All you need to do is go to Squarespace and they'll ask you this quick quiz. They're like, what do you want to make your website for? And you're like, I don't know, I'm a photographer or whatever. Or I want a blog. And then they're like, well, you might like these templates. And then they show you a bunch of templates and you click on one and then it puts it in this sort of staging area. And you're like, oh, I'll change that. I'll swap that photo out. I'll change that text. Oh, I'll add a contact form, you know, and some extra pages here and there. It all takes, I mean, realistically, you would be done in less than an afternoon making a website from zero to complete, even with the domain name and all of that stuff. It's very, very easy easy. And also, if you're the sort of person who wants to customize every little detail, Squarespace is super customizable. Also, you're never going to get lost because there's tons of useful help stuff telling you how to do everything. But if you do get stuck and you're like, oh, it's not really covered, well, they have 24-7 support. So you just be like, hey, Squarespace, I'm stuck with this. And they'll be like, don't worry about it, Facts Boy. We got you. This is how you do that. It's amazing. Plus, there's tons of extra features. They've got email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analysis, commercial options. I mentioned the support. It's 24-7. I said that, right? Look, everything you could ever want is in one place. So, when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, do it with Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch your site, go to squarespace.com slash megaprojects, and you'll get 10% of your first purchase of a website or a domain. And back to today's video. Setting aside what was going to happen inside the dome, building work needed to commence. After difficulties funding the project through private investment, the government stated that the dome would be funded with public money or with help from the National Lottery. The first job was clearing the disused gas works and derelict buildings that peppered the site to begin the cleanup operation. Since this was a former industrial site, the ground was saturated with decades of waste and hazardous materials. To remove this, soil vapor extraction was used to remove volatile chemicals such as benzene and petrol. This process of removing dangerous pollutants and converting them into harmless byproducts was carried out on two-thirds of the site. Almost 220,000 cubic meters of material were removed to a specially designated landfill site and replaced with clean soil. Another safety procedure was a slurry wall being installed around the site to prevent contaminants from leaching into the Thames. There were also concerns about the dome weakening the southbound Blackwall Tunnel, which runs below the dome's footprint. Fortunately, it was a relatively quick fix, the tunnel being reinforced to reduce vibration damage, and the dome could begin to be built. It needed to be done quickly, since time waits for no man, and it wouldn't hang on for the dome either. Tony Blair told a parade of journalists while breaking ground at the site, This is a statement of our faith in our capacity to do this bigger and better than anyone else. Actual construction began on the site in June 1997, with the driving of the first of 8,000 piles for the foundations, followed by drains and service trenches. A concrete ring beam was erected around the circumference of the dome. Next were the 12 masts, which were assembled on site from 1,600 tons of steel sections, with each mast sitting on a quadrupod steel frame anchored to four inclined concrete blocks. Six bolt holes, 35.5 mm or 1.4 inches in diameter, were diamond drilled 650 mm, that's 25.5 
five inches deep per block to secure the resin anchors for each leg of the frame. On the quadrupods sit the 90 meter, 295 feet tall masts. Each mast was welded together before being lifted into position, with them all being erected between the 13th and the 30th of October 1997. Once the masts were up, the fabric skin, made from Teflon coated fabric, was connected to tension cables by a team of abseil and construction workers at the beginning of 1998. The government decision that the dome should have a useful life beyond the year 2000 prompted the decision to use the expensive Teflon material instead of the cheaper PVC coated polyester originally specified. This made the Millennium Dome the lightest building of its size in the world. Openings in the center of the roof release rising hot air, and 12 fans draw in cooler external air. Water runoff is filtered through reed beds and recycled as gray water for toilet flushing. This was even included as an attraction with the water cycle of the dome being exhibited outside. Other toilet waste is dried and then burned to produce electricity for the dome. The entire dome enclosure was completed in 15 months and handed over to the management team for the exhibition fit out in autumn of 1998. On time, and well under budget. Additionally to the dome being built, a major extension of the Jubilee Line of the London Underground was commissioned, with a new station being added, North Greenwich. This would provide hassle-free transport for visitors, setting them right down at the front door of the new landmark. More on that in just a little bit. It seems that nothing was wasted then, with an efficient workforce of 1,500 people on site building the structure in time and on budget, a clever, sustainable power source, and a new transport link. Everything just seemed to be coming together. Surely, things were on the up for the big top. After years of discussions with nothing being decided, the Litmus Group finally agreed on what was to be housed inside the dome. It would reflect the visitors and the world around them. The dome was divided into different aspects, showing who we are, what we do, and where we live. Scattered around the dome would be a series of 14 zones that would focus on specific parts of the themes. In the center of the dome would be a large performance area, staging a musical show featuring 160 acrobats. The exhibitions, including Body, Mind, Money, Home Planet, and Faith, attracted big-name sponsors like Boots, Ford, and Tesco. When details were revealed about the contents of the dome, it appeared to be a product of 90s expressionism, art, architecture, and well, it was all just a little bit odd. For example, the largest attraction, the body designed by John Hackney and built in only 20 weeks, was a giant pink-cheeked male and female body intertwined. Visitors would enter through the leg of the male figure, and from there was an uninspiring escalator whisking people into a chamber featuring a beating animatronic heart hanging from the ceiling. While gazing up at the organ, a deafening scream would shriek out to demonstrate what happens when a person is scared. Certainly, a few terrified children would give a demonstration of that live. From the heart was a trip up to the head. Once inside the skull, there was another surprise with the eye sockets, cheekbones, and mouth resembling a theatre. Each cavity housed two small brains enjoying a comedy performance by the large brain wearing a fez on stage, voiced by Tommy Cooper. Weird. A running theme of the Millennium Dome was good intentions with the aim of educating and informing the public about the world around them. But it just all ended up being really weird. Nevertheless, everything did seem to be on track for a great exhibition. With money coming from the National Lottery, top designers, and now major corporate sponsorship, how could it all go wrong? Granted, it couldn't be all smooth sailing, and there were a few problems to contend with. Political interference, no creative direction or clear statement of purpose, an idealistic target of visitor numbers, and the relentless timescale were certainly major hiccups. Apart from that, though, it all seemed like it was going okay. The deadline for the dome had arrived, the 31st of December 1999. Ready or not, the dome was going to open, and it was going to be the center point for the UK's millennium celebrations. Jenny Page was on site to go over all of the details and make sure that the night went off smoothly. As the winter night drew in and the last century ticked away, uh, it was a major problem. 10,000 guests were expected at the dome, a mixture of high-level politicians, members of the royal family, designers of the exhibitions, VIPs, and members of the public who had won tickets to the opening night. Doesn't sound like too much of a problem, but due to an admin error, several thousand tickets hadn't been posted. This was rectified by having the tickets at the nearby Stratford train station where guests could collect them, go through security, and onto the tube to the dome. It started 
well, but deteriorated as more people arrived at the station. With so many tickets needing collecting, and there only being one metal detector on hand for security checks, queues intensified. Notice boards displaying useless information fueled irate parents as they tried to console their tearful children. Meanwhile, invited members of the press were seeing the positives of this chaos as they stood about scribbling in their notebooks, trying to think of witty headlines for the morning's front pages. Two specific families that didn't suffer any of these woes were the Prime Minister and his family, along with other ministers, whose journey via the London Underground went perfectly. The other was the royal family who arrived at the Dome by boat. When greeted at the Dome, they were surprised by the lack of people there. By the time most of the other guests had arrived, most of the exhibits were closed and not a glass of fizz was in sight. The audience inside the auditorium and at home watched on as the acrobatic show and fireworks display rang in this new era. Everything seemed to go off like a well-executed night of celebration that they would never forget. Certainly, the people stuck in the cold night at the tube station wouldn't. First of January 2000. After the chaos of the night before, a new year and a new start to the dome began with its opening to the public. Before its grand opening, pre-booked ticket sales were looking good, with over a million being purchased in the first month. The hopes of recouping the £750 million of cost appeared to be right on track. The organizers hung all of their hopes on 12 million sales during the year. The team in charge of the project were advised that 8 million was a more realistic target, but carried on expecting the dome to prove them right. However, the business plan was flawed from the start. Recouping the funds hung on ticket sales alone. The sponsors would see a return on their investment from merchandise sales and advertising. The money poured into the dome from the public purse, though, wouldn't see any of it. The bad press didn't seem to deter visitors from the attraction. If you were to visit the Dome during the first two weeks, you'd be greeted by a two-hour queue for the body exhibit. That wasn't just down to its popularity. It was never designed to handle that volume of visitors. The sponsor for the body, Boots, was not too happy about the queues and withheld funds until it was sorted. Time tickets were trialed to ease the congestion. This helped somewhat, but it was not a permanent solution. Added to this, many of the attractions were out of order. Effectively, the Dome was having its shakedown crews in public with all the teething problems being experienced by frustrated visitors. Coupled with the contractors handily going on holiday as soon as the dome opens, it meant no one was around to fix any issues. When the first visitor numbers were published, they were half of what was expected. Sponsors were incensed at the numbers and began withholding funds. Additional lottery funds were requested, but with the caveat that better management was put in place. The writing was on the wall for Jenny Page. In this case, it was the tabloid front pages. At the end of January, she resigned due to poor attendance figures being published. Desperate for a new head of the dome, the government brought in Pierre Yve, also known as PY, from Disneyland Paris. With his expertise, he may just save the project and get visitor numbers back on track. His first task was sorting out the star attraction. The queuing situation was swiftly dealt with by diverting the flow of visitors through the sponsorship village and away from the body near the entrance to the dome. Queuing time dropped to five minutes in one month. A small victory. However, later in February, a survey found that the zones felt disconnected. Some weren't entertaining or had a clear message about what they were about. Chief amongst that was the central acrobatic show from the mind of Genesis bassist Peter Gabriel. Telling the story of Earth people meeting the Sky people was just too eccentric for the public to comprehend. Following the rainy summer months, tons of free tickets being issued and a new ad campaign didn't detract from the bad headlines. It seemed nothing could be done to save the dome. The only good headlines came from an attempted diamond heist at the dome. I'll save that for the Casual Criminalist podcast. If you'd like a video on it, comment below. In the final month of the attraction, PY did manage to squeeze in one last interactive exhibit. A passion of his was ice skating, so a rink was installed to go along with the other Christmas-themed attractions. These new additions did little to improve visitor numbers, though. With the end nearing, it was time to evaluate how the attraction had fared. The UK's National Audit Office published a report blaming unrealistic attendance targets for the Dome's financial problems, which had steadily increased throughout the year. But in December, the Play Zone won an award for the best event space in the world. To say the dome was a failure may be too harsh, but the ticket sales and feedback cannot be disputed. The overall impression of the dome was of its strangeness, eccentricity, and lack of consistency within it. It was an ambitious project that had not been attempted before. With more planning and a clear creative message, it might have survived for more than a year. Instead, there was a mass auction held for the contents of the dome, with 17,000 items going up for sale, including the benches dotted around the dome and its kitchen equipment. Once everything was sold for a bargain price, all that remained was the big white tent carcass 
of the Greenwich Peninsula that held up 12 bright yellow masts. After a few small-scale events held in the dome after its closure, a buyer was finally found. Now the O2 Arena, it's one of the most popular venues in the world. It may not have been a success in 2000, but it certainly is now. PY summed up the Millennium Dome with this simple phrase. Politics and business do not mix. The dome is proof of that.